Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, AJ is a PhD candidate in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University, um, working with uh, our colleague, Professor Barbara Groves there, and she's been exploring some interesting topics and challenges at the intersection of core AI uh, agents um, in HCI, um, in particular looking at uh, notions of how computers can reason about and support teamwork uh, in mixed networks, and um, AJ was a um, Microsoft Research Fellow here, and she was a two-time intern, um, each time doing two or three projects when one would have been great. <laughs> and uh, it's, been, it's been, a, been a pleasure to get to know AJ. And this is actually a job talk today. So, AJ, tomorrow. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the nice introduction, and thank you for coming to the talk. It's a pleasure to be here today, again, for the third time. And this time talking about the research I've been doing for the uh, past few years at Harvard University. Um, today's talk is about making collaboration work in real life. Collaboration is a special kind of group activity in which participants come together and, and try to accomplish something that they cannot do alone easily. We see examples of collaboration in our everyday life. One example is when we cook dinner with our friends. Um, or when we go to a music concert, we see uh, different artists playing different instruments but contributing to the same musical piece. Another example is sports games. We see different players with different capabilities playing at different um, positions but having the same goal of winning the game at the end of the day. There are also more organizationally structured and dynamic examples of collaboration. Rescue teams is one example. The other one is many people working in these big companies contributing, big companies like Microsoft contributing to the next big software product. Lately, with increasing connectivity, we started to see different examples of collaboration. We started to see collaboration between people that are located at different parts of the world and between people that are not connected with social or organization structures, but still contributing to generate something big. Wikipedia is one of my favorite examples for showing that how much value we can generate by the collaboration of people. Another nice example is the Looking at Home project uh, by the University of Delaware and Berkeley that motivates people to donate the idle time on their computers uh, to solve some computationally expensive research problems. However, still in these um, systems that are assisted by computers, these collaborations are assisted by computer systems, computers are not really taking a part in this collaboration. They don't have incentives to help this collaboration much or they are not solving a piece of this collaboration. So in today's computer systems, people have, computer agents have, computer systems have better interfaces, they have more computational power, they know more about each other and about the world, but still at the deeper problem solving level, we need to tell these computer systems what to do and when to do it. One such interaction is the search engines. When I type an ambiguous word like Turkey, where I am from, to Google search engine, it gives me all these different um, pre-computed fixed answers. The system doesn't know about the context that I'm in and my intentions why I'm doing this search. So it doesn't really help me to accomplish my task easier. It's just giving me a pre-computed answer. Another example is these error screens. The computer is notifying the user that a big problem happened in the computer with this not easily readable message. But in fact, the computer agent is capable of going into the computer system, solving the problem for the computer system, and taking the initiative. But it's not doing that. This is why I believe that if we can have computer agents that are partners other than servers, we can improve the efficiency of com computer systems. In fact, even in today's systems, computers are no longer alone. They act in mixed complex networks with other computer agents and people. In these mixed networks, each participant has diverse needs. 
They have diverse information about the world and about each other. This is why we need collaborative teamwork models that will bring these diverse partners together to accomplish something. I believe that if you, having these computer agents as partners in the future um, will have a lot of potential to bring people together so that they can work more effect effectively and also to build computer systems that can interact with people better and also help to, key, to, help to solve some key problems of today's such as traffic, energy allocation, information overload. The talk I'll be giving today will address some key challenges in building these computer agents that can work effectively with people. The first part of the talk will focus on representations and decision theoretic models for building agents that can work effectively with people. And then I will show how we can use these representations and decision theoretic models to manage helpful behavior and communication better in collaborative, team, in collaborative activities. In the second part of the talk, um, I will show you what happens if we have people in the loop and how people perceive these utilities, uh, utilities as computed by these computational models. And I will conclude my talk with a real-world application of collaboration. There has been work on collaboration um, by formally defining what collaboration is. One such model is joint intentions proposed by Cohen and Levesque. Another one is shared plans formalism proposed by Barbara Grouse and Sarit Krauss. What these models do is they in detail define the requirements to have a good successful teamwork. They are mostly, they are all logical models. They don't have notions of cost and utilities and probabilities. This is why they define requirements very well, but it is very difficult to apply them to real life. There has been some work on getting these models and deploying, in, deploying them into um, real world. Milan Tambe worked on this. He applied these, he tried to apply these formalisms into um, military training and robo-soccer domains, but his approach is domain specific and doesn't generalize to uh, many domains that we see in real life. My work um, is based on the shared plan formalism. This is why I want to give you a quick summary of the requirements that shared plan states for having a collaborative, successful collaborative activity. The first requirement is bringing agents together and forming groups that will work together. The second and third requirements are interleaved. It is about how agents, given that they come together, how can they divide tasks among each other so that each participant can go plan and perform its own part of the plan. One important observation here is that the agents do not require to know what partners are doing. They are just obligated to plan for their own task and accomplish it successfully. However, there is a fourth requirement. The fourth requirement says that collaboration is more than these agents divide, divide their task and then performing their own parts, but they still need to reason about what their partners are doing and support each other when needed, because collaboration is more than the sum of its individual parts. So the focus of this part of the talk is designing decision-making strategies for supporting the supportive behavior in collaborative activities, given that we have uncertainty and partial information in the real world. Let's visit an example of a complex mixed network that we can have in real life. Here we have a person driving in traffic and he's connected to a computer agent that knows a lot about this person. He has ex this computer agent has access to the person's calendar. It has access to traffic prediction services and satellites. And this computer agent is helping this person about making this commute much more effective by doing mobile opportunistic planning or informing the, age, the person about some surprises that might happen in the traffic. The person might be also connected to a different computer agent that is scheduling his meeting for the next day. And at the same time, the person is talking with his colleague on the, on the phone. And these computer agents might be connected to another agent that is working at home to coordinate for dinner plans. 
these complex mixed networks have different characteristics. That they have some important characteristics. First of all, the participants are distributed. They have partial information about the world and about what each other is doing. But still, they need to reason about their partners so that they can help each other when needed. Through this talk, I will be focus on, focusing on one particular example of mobile opportunistic planning. This example is influenced by the work I've done with Eric Corvis and Christopher Meek. Um, this system was called mobile opportunistic planning. In this system, we have a computer agent that is learning about the products that the user is interested in. And while the user is driving, searches the area looking for some good deals for the person for, and generating mobile opportunistic plans for these users. So here, in this example, we have a collaboration between the person that is driving on the way and also the computer agent that is doing mobile opportunistic planning. This person and the agent are collaborating to have the most effective commute as possible. Here, the person picks a plan. He has multiple choices. If he is going from Redmond to Kirkland, he might choose to take the Redmond way or I-405. Similarly, the computer agent can come up with multiple options for this person. One might be a gas station, another is stopping at a different gas station. The third plan might be a combination of a, combination of a gas station and grocery store. So in this collaboration, this agent has partial information about what this person is doing because the person cannot really tell what he is planning to do at each step. It's too disruptive. The person picks a plan. He might pick the Redmond Way plan. And the computer agent may have a belief about the plan that this person is choosing. The agent may, might believe that this, agent, this person is likely to take the Redmond Way with 90% chance. And with 10% chance, he might take the highway. So, we need representations to represent this agent's uncertainty about the probable plans that the partners are doing. And also, we need decision theoretic models that will work given this belief and uncertainty. Here I'm proposing a probabilistic representation called probabilistic recipe trees that will be a solution to this problem. In this representation, the top node is the collaborative plan that these participants are collaborating on. Then this collaborative plan decomposes into subtasks of this plan. This might be driving and the other might be mobile opportunistic planning. And then each task stochastically decomposes into possible plans for doing this activity. Here these probabilities on these branches represent the likelihood that this agent who is doing this task is doing this plan. And then we open the tree until we have all basic level tasks on the leaves. So it's a hierarchical representation that is showing agents' beliefs about what their partners are doing. So here we have a probabilistic recipe tree for the mobile opportunistic planning example showing the agents' belief about the evening commute plan. Here the evening commute plan branches into subtasks, which are driving and opportunistic planning. And the driving task stochastically branches into possible plans for doing this task, which is Redmond Way and I-405. And here, the basic level tasks are the short fragments that the user needs to drive. We can also represent constraints on these PRTs. Um, for example, these two tasks are sharing the same resource of a person, so they are connected with a resource, resource constraint. And then the basic level task may have some temporal constraints between them. So here now I showed you a representation for agents, please. Now I will show you that we can use this representation to reason about the utility of probabilistic plans. The important thing is by having these Cost and utilities and decision and utility calculations on these PRTs, now we will be able to enable decision theoretic reasoning on these logical teamwork models. So how do we do that? We in insert cost and success probabilities 
to the leaves of this probabilistic recipitry. They represent the cost of doing a basic level action and probable, success probability of a basic level action. The agents are able to estimate these things and I will show you an example of how they can do so. Then, to capture the, ex the cost and success probability of a plan, we propagate these cost and success probabilities to upwards. So the cost of a plan is the summation of the cost of the basic level tasks. Similarly, the success probability of a plan is the product of the success probability of the children. So here we have a way to calculate the, expect the cost and utilities of plans. Similarly, we can propagate these cost and success probabilities from the plan level to the task level. So here, the success probability and cost of a task is the weighted average of the success probabilities and cost of the children. And finally, when we reach the top level, which is the collaborative activity that these participants are collaborating on, we are now we are able to predict the expected utility of accomplishing this plan. It is the value that these participants have to see this collaborative activity being performed times the success probability of the collaborative plan minus the cost. So yeah. in the example, um, you're branching on the drive versus the ancillary activities um, with, I'm assuming, static probabilities, but you can imagine an agent convincing uh, the user to, to change the plan. <clears throat> so some of the tasks might be on the agent side, um, generate an alternative and convince the user that this is a better idea that's the opportunistic part of it, and folding the convincement and the probability of change into the actual model. Do you have it in there now? We just assume we started to collect probabilities on user goals. I both have operations to modify these PRTs in real time, and also decision theoretic rules about when they need to communicate mesh plans to have a more successful plan, and how agents can learn about what the person is doing in real time, and also how they can convince. And I will show both. Um, points in the next slides. So you can ask, okay, it's nice to have these basic level cost and success probabilities, but where do these probabilities come from? Here I will show you how we can get, extract this knowledge for this mobile opportunistic planning example. In fact, to act in a world like this and help people, the computer agents already have access to a lot of information about the people and the world. It knows the calendar, have access to clear flow to get the live predict prediction, and may access to the time cost function for this person. So when this computer agent needs to evaluate a probabilistic plan, it looks at the basic level action. So here the basic level actions for the driving task are the short fragments the user needs to drive. So to get how long it takes to drive on Redmond Way, it can access the clear flow and get these values, and then access to the time cost function to get, the, to get a dollar value for these basic level actions. Similarly, to estimate the cost of doing different mobile opportunistic plans, the computer agent can use the cost analysis component of the mobile opportunistic planning system and can guess the divergent cost for going to a grocery store, spending time there, including the fuel that we'll be spending and also the time we'll be spending. And to get these probabilities on these branches, in this example, the computer agent can access to the predestination system that is developed by John Crum and Eric Horvitz to predict where the user is going at a given particular time. But as Eric pointed out a few minutes ago, these beliefs are not static. They will be changing in real world. This is why I also defined operations that can modify PRTs. One way of modifying a PRT is adding a new task, and at the end we end up with an updated plan with a new task added in it. Another way of updating a PRT is subtraction, where we decide not to do a part of the plan, um, get rid of it, and have come up with an updated plan with less in which we have less to do. Another way of updating a PRT is replacement. We take a part of the PRT 
And we predict what a new way can be for doing that task. For example, the agent may convince the person that um, taking the highways is a better option than the Redmond way. So we can see these probabilities changing. And then put this updated plan here and come up with an updated plan for the collaborative activity. So the nice thing about PRTs is if we have some good independence relations between the task, then they are very efficient. They are modular to, because we can just get some part of it, change something about it, plug it in without changing different parts of the PRT. So here I show you this nice representation and I also show you that we can estimate the utility of a plan. Now I will show you how we can reason by using PRTs. Yes, John. Is the list of tasks that's underneath each plan deterministic given the, given the plan? Um, here I'm not really talking about what kind of planning algorithms you can use to get PRTs. The only requirement is the agent should have access to a planning algorithm that will predict what the user will be doing. Okay. But if there's, let, let's say I have a plan, like I'm looking at the Redmond mm -hmm. Way node, and there may be more than one way to accomplish that, to, to break that down into different tasks. There, you know, obviously there are a lot of different routes I could, I could take. And so can you represent that? You can also have a diff um, another level of stochastic branching that is decomposing this Redmond Way plan to also different plans for doing the Redmond Way plan. Mm -hmm. You can open this tree as much as you can and you can have different levels of stochastic uh, branchings from a plan to a different plans or different tasks. So here I will show you different ways we can, we can reason using PRTs. One possible way is commitment reconciliation. So here we have a PRT and the agent reasons, reasons about adapting or abandoning the commitment. An example is the computer agent reasons about whether there should, we, we should pick up a passenger on the way and do a carpool rather than sticking with our original plan. And here the computer agent can put this new um, update plan in, see how it changes the rest, and get an expected utility for doing this new plan with respect to the old one. Another way we can use PRTs is for meshing plans. It's exactly what Eric mentioned. Here the computer agents have a probabilistic um, belief for what the team is doing, and then the computer agent can reason about um, how this plan should change given this new information about the world. Here if the computer agent observes that the person is taking a different route than expected, it, the computer agent can use this representation to update part of the plan or to communicate with the agent, the person to motivate him to update his part of the plan. Um, another possible way is to reason about the future, to estimate the expected utility of this plan in real world. Um, agents can also use this for coordination and the part I will be focusing on will be for managing helpful behavior including communication decisions. So here I will show that we can use these PRTs to build decision theoretic models for managing helpful behavior and then I'm, I, I will empirically show that by having these decision theoretic models we can improve the performance of teamwork. So these helpful behavior models are decision theoretic rules about when agents need to help people. The main idea is really simple. It says that the agent should calculate the expected utility of helping and help if the utility is bigger than the cost. One way of helping is communicating. Um, the agents can help people by informing them about an observation or responding when they ask for an observation. And another way of helping is performing a helpful act. For example, in the mobile opportunistic planning domain, the agent realizes that there is a big traffic, the person will be late to the next meeting, the computer agent can take the initiative, send a message to the person that the, the, pers the user is supposed to meet in half an hour as a way of helpful act. So just to show an example of how informed decisions work for this mobile opportunistic planning domain, here the computer agent find, finds out that there's a big traffic, there's an accident on Redmond Way, and there's 
traffic on Redmond Way. And now the agent is reasoning about interrupting this person with this new information, um, given that the person will have some big cost of interruption uh, for getting this message. Here, the a computer agent will capture the expected utility of informing compared with the interruption cost. So how do the agent do this? First, the computer agent reasons about the original plan that these participants are doing. Here, the person is likely to, have to take the Redmond Way, and the expected duration for this plan is 19 minutes. Next, the computer agent reasons about how the expected utility of this plan changes given this new information about the world. So here we see that the cost of taking the Redmond Way increases a lot, and the expected duration of this plan increases to 48 minutes. Next, the agent reasons what would happen if the person is notified about the surprise. Here the person would update the plan so that he wouldn't take the Redmond Way anymore. He would take the highways, not to get stuck in the traffic. Um, and here the expected duration of this new updated plan will be 28 minutes. So putting all these together to make an informed decision, the computer agent compares the expected utility of the original plan with the updated plan that will be created after this informed this inform action, compare it with the cost of interruption, and inform if the inform utility gain we get from this inform action is larger than the cost of interruption. How does the agent know what the updated probabilities are after the information? I mean, here it's very clear, but in general it could be, oh, Someone's trying to juggle six things, and I, I'm an agent, and I tell you about something. How do I know how the probabilities will land? So the computer agent has a way to predict what the person is doing, what, which plan the person is taking. It is an assumption we are making to implement probabilistic recipes at the first place. And the, pers the computer agent also have an estimate for the context that the person is working on, what the person is believing. So in fact, the computer agent uses its belief about the person and the planning algorithm to get this part of the plan. So, I think what John's asking is, what's the, if, if, you, if you were going to make that assumption, that, that, that's a box that will give you these things, this invitation, how might you build that box? Is, is, is that going to be a really hard challenge to come up with this probability someday? Is, is it a big machine learning problem? Is it, how, how do we do that? What do you think? It is a combination. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious, like, how do you decide 0 0.0 to 1.0? I mean, it could be some, you would give them some information and they do something else. Um, so, it is a machine, it's a combination of a machine learning and planning challenge to see, given information, how the plan changes. And the, here I'm assuming that the computer agent have those resources to reason about what the person is doing, but it is something that the domain expert that is implementing these PRTs to a particular domain, um, he needs to reason about how this will work. Yeah, I imagine these kinds of patients would frame uh, the learning challenges, and given how well you can do with those challenges, you want to feedback that uncertainty and see how you can be using your presentation. So. So here, the idea is, given that, we can predict what the person is doing, and we can predict how the plan will change, giving some information. We can use these PRTs to capture the expected utility of giving this information to the user. Yeah. Um, to empirically test these helpful behavior models, I designed a game on the Color Trails Test Pass system. So, this color trace test pass system is a form is um, a game setting that is developed by Harvard. Um, it enables the study of task-oriented group activities. The nice thing about color trails is it abstracts away from particular test domains and can create an, a nice analogy without really building the characteristics of a real dom domain, which is really really expensive to do. And these. Game settings are used extensively to study various research problems such as negotiation, um, team formation, and reputation in many countries all over the world. And in fact, 
they are using this game setting to train astronauts that will go to space these days. It is a good um, mediator between the very simple um, behavioral economics games such as Prisoner's Dilemma and more very complex, hard to implement real world domains. So you can ask why I'm not doing these experiments on, for example, the mobile opportunistic planning domain. First of all, it's very difficult to implement those kind of domains in real life successfully. And even we implement that, it is very difficult to analyze the results that we got from that kind of a domain because there are so many domain characteristics we need to think about and there is a no domain knowledge we need to reason about. But by mapping these real world test domains to an abstract game setting, it is much easier to reason about um, to, it's much easier to reason about just the problems that we want to investigate and get rid of the domain details. So here we have this game board in this game. We have two players that are representing the person driving on the way and the computer agent. They are collaborating on an activity such that one player, the recipient player, is trying to get to one of the goals which may represent driving challenge and the other player, the observer player, is trying to get um, to its own goal. This might represent the mobile opportunistic planning. And here, these um, agents have resources that they have to move on this game board and reach to the goals. These resources may represent the fuel that the person needs to spend to go to a particular destination or the, the time that this um, user needs to spend. Um, to reflect the partial information the participants may have about each other, these players are not able to see what chips the other players have, so they really don't know which plan these agents will be taking to get to their individual goals. And also, to reflect an agent's uncertainty about the world, some positions on this game board may stochastically turn into trap positions, which may prevent from these players moving on this game board. This is this an analogy to having a traffic condition on the way which prevents um, the person driving ahead. So on this game setting, the observer player is able to observe these trap locations as they appear. You can think of this as the computer agent having access to the traffic prediction services and getting notified when something important happens in the traffic. But the recipient player cannot observe these, on, these stochastic events. And there are diff two different uncertainties that happen in this world. One uncertainty is the observer's uncertainty about the recipient's chips, and the other is um, uncertainty about the world, which represents how frequently these traps are appearing on the game board. And there are three different ways the observer player can help the recipient by informing him about these trap locations, by responding to him if he asks about these trap locations, and by giving away some resources as a way of half -lect. Here, I will just show you the results I got for the communication protocols, but I have similar results I got for comparing different half elect protocols available in the papers. So here I'm comparing um, Two decision theoretic protocols for informing and asking, these are using PRTs to make decisions. And I'm comparing these decision theoretic protocols to logical protocols that were proposed by the previous work. Because in these work, the decision theoretic reasoning was not possible. So here, I compare these four different communication protocols with different levels of observer uncertainty and world uncertainty. The height of these bars represents the score that we get from these games, given that we follow these different protocols. So here, the important... Is the score the fraction of time that the goals were reached? Is that the score? It is a factor, and also whether these agents are able to achieve these goals, and how much resources they are spending to get to, get to their goals. So it's a combination of different factors. Here, the important result is, by having decision theoretic reasoning, for managing helpful behavior, we are able to improve the performance of the collaborative activity. Because for all communication costs and uncertainty levels, the decision theoretic protocols perform equally good 
or better than the logical axioms. Because these decision theoretic protocols are able to adapt the change in cost and uncertainties in the real life. Another important result is we can see where one protocol is better than the other. For example, if the uncertainty is low, it is better to inform each other about the changes. Whereas when, when uncertainty is really, really high, it is better to wait until being asked. So in this part of the talk, I presented to you a new representation for agents police about what partners are doing. And, I, and this representation enabled decision theoretic reasoning on formal teamwork models. And I also demonst demonstrated that we can use this representation to build decision theoretic rules about helpful behavior and show that we can improve the performance of the collaborative activity by doing this decision theoretic reasoning. So at this point, you can ask, OK, we have these computational models. We, ha can, we have these representations. But what happens when these computer agents use these computational models to interact with people? Because people may not see this utility in the way that people, computer agents calculate them. So the second part of the talk, I will mention what happens when we have people in the loop and how they perceive the utility that are calculated by these computational models. So the previous approach that I presented in the helpful behavior models use this flow to decide when to communicate. It first detects the changes and distinguishes these changes as a way, as an opportunity to communicate, and then captures the collaborative benefit of communicating and does so if this benefit is positive. However, when we have people in the loop, there's a different decision that the computer agent needs to make. The computer agent also needs to, needs to reason about whether the partner is willing to communicate or not. Because when we have people in the loop, even if we have computer agents using the best computational models and capturing the utility correctly, if the person is not able to see this benefit, it is just an unnecessary disturbance for the user, and the user will be unhappy with this computational system. Going back to the mobile opportunistic planning challenge, here again, we have the computer agent and the person, but this time the computer agent needs some information from the user. For example, the computer agent may ask about, you know, what do you see in the traffic? How are you feeling? Are you nervous? Are you busy? It can ask these kind of questions. And it will do so if the expected utility is larger than the cost, if the net utility is positive. However, here we have the person as a black box. We really don't know what the person is doing. But we know that this person will accept some of these interruptions and classify them as valuable and reject some of these interruptions. In this part of the talk, we will try to understand how this filter works. To investigate this problem, I'm also using a game setting that's built on the color trails infrastructure. Here we have these game boards. And we have two players on this game board, one representing the person, the other representing the computer agent. They have individual goals that they are trying to achieve. They can move one step at a time to get closer to their goal location. However, these goal locations may move stochastically on this game board, representing the uncertainty that these players may have about the real world. The person player is able to observe where these goals are moving, but the agent player doesn't know where its goal is moving. So it's at some part, times in the game, the computer agent may interrupt the person and ask where, these, where its goal is to be more successful in this game setting. In, so I used a combination of the centralized MDP techniques and the helpful behavior models to capture this full durational expected utility of interruption. Then in the empirical analysis, I'm comparing the human responses to this decision theoretic baseline to see where the person perception differ, differs from these computational models. I recruited 26 subjects from Craigslist. We had housewives, we had college students, and each subject were given 26 cases of this interruption game. 
they, they received 26 different interruptions. These interruptions vary two factors. One is the magnitude of the interruption outcome as it computed by an oracle that knows where goals are. So this is a fully rational estimate of how beneficial an, an interruption is for the collaborative activity. And as a second factor, we investigated what is the effect of the present, presented partner type on the likelihood that the people will be accepting these interruptions. So through all these 36 interruptions, the people were always paired with the same computer agent that is using this full rational estimate to make interruption decisions. But sometimes we told the subjects that they are playing with a person sitting in the next room so that we can investigate this partner effect. And there are two hypotheses we investigated. The first one is, I believed people will be more likely to accept interruptions if the outcome is higher. Because if it is more beneficial, so the person will be able to see this, especially in this abstract game setting, and respond to interruptions respectively. As a second hypothesis, I believe that the people's responses will not be affected by the partner type. Because I believe utility is such a clear reason to accept or reject an interruption, the partner type shouldn't have an effect. My advisor didn't agree with me on this. She said, I believe the partner type will have an effect because the previous work tells us that the way, peop the way people see their partners affect how they collaborate with them. So just understand about this is one idea. What are you saying beyond more than if people think something is better, they'll do it? <clears throat> and I mean, People are more likely to accept if outcome, if the computed outcome is higher, you're saying? Collaborative outcome as computed, as computed. As so computed by these collaborators. That, that could be uh, a measure of how well, how well your models are performing, right? Because you, you, you do credit assignment, you can have a, a bunch of reasons why that wouldn't happen. One, for example, um, people are, don't understand the value. Uh, two, something's wrong with the model, and it is, it, it, it's less valuable than, than the model the system thinks it is, and people know value really well, and, and, and so on. So there's many possibilities that would that could influence whether this is one is verified or not, and what it means when it is verified. Because we have these abstract game setting, we are able to exactly capture the expected utility of interruption by using the centralized MDP methods and then using the helpful behavior models to get the expected utility of interruption. Because, you know, in this game setting, we are able to control um, where the goals are moving and where the people mm -hmm. are and use map this game to an MDP and capture what is the expected utility of the state. But these are real people, right? These are the craze, craze people. Yeah. So we don't really, we, we have a model of the cost of Russian, for example. So given that, we assume that these people are fully rational and they will be acting in the way that these computer, computer models predict, we are able to capture the fully rational baseline for the outcome. However, here we are testing how these computational models, how well they can predict human responses in real life. But I'm still not clear. Mm -hmm. what, what, even with, the, even with this, this iterative model that's computing back the ideal values, we could be wrong about the estimates based upon our not understanding the cost of eruption in a context for the user at this moment. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Here, in this game setting, um, the cost of interruption is mapped to these players not moving for one game round. So here we are assuming that there is no cognitive cost for interruption because these people are only focusing on this game setting, they are not doing something else. And we are mapping the cost of interruption to something about the game, about not being able to move for one game round. So given that the cost is, of... Is that reasonable? It is, the reason we do it this way is so that we, we will be able to capture the expected utility of interruption accurately given for this game board and so that we can analyze where the human perception differs from these computational models. When you get an interruption, do you lose a turn? I mean, it's you lose a turn. Okay. You lose so a it turn. is enforced. So I think there's a matter of personal outcome. 
or personal game versus the, uh, the collaborative game, and does your model kind of capture both of those? So, for example, if I'm playing the game and I have a goal that I need to achieve, and then you interrupt me, and so is there, so would I rationally act so that I can have a higher collaborative outcome versus whether I want to have my own personal game? Does that not take that into account? The game is designed so that the final score of the game is the cumulative score of the agent and the person. So the person should be focusing on the collaborative outcome to make decisions so that it can perform better in the game. However, after I show the empirical results, I will show that even in this fully collaborative setting, people care about their own part of the utility more than the agents. And I will show you results about that. Timing of so maybe I'm in the middle of making a decision in my own game, and so the timing of the interruption might have an effect. I don't know whether you considered that or whether that was. To get rid of that effect in the game, we had different fa phases. For example, one phase was, was about only interruptions, and the other phase was about moving on the game board, and the third phase was about showing how the world changes to the people, so that we tried to distinguish these decisions from each other. But again, even in this game setting, there might be other factors that are coming, in, coming into effect, but we try to get rid of all these different F factors as much as possible so that we can capture a full rational baseline of the interruption outcome. So the final results look like this. Here the y-axis is the interruption acceptance rate, and the x-axis is the expected value of interruption as computed by these computational models. The red line is the acceptance rate when the partner type is a person, and the blue line is when the partner type is an agent. Here, we see that when the interruption outcome is obvious, for example, it's negative or it's significantly positive, people are very good at seeing this and rejecting these interruptions and accepting these interruptions in a good, in a good percentage. So we see that even in this, in this game setting, calculating the fully rational um, you estimate of the interruption outcome is a good estimate of what people are doing, how they do their decisions. However, in this region where the outcome is not that obvious, because it is positive but slight, they are having a hard time understanding whether it's beneficial or not, we see that the partner type has an effect. People are more likely to accept interruptions coming from partner than computer systems. And this agrees with the previous work on the way people behave in collaborative domains. They are more likely to collaborate with systems that more, look more like people. And then in the next work, I will not be talking about that here in detail, but in the next work, I apply some basic learning algorithms to see why this happens and realize that people are more likely to overestimate their own outcome and underestimate the agent's outcome, even in this fully collaborative settings. So to revisit the hypothesis, we show that the acceptance rate increases as outcome increases in these um, until the outcome reaches to a significant value, and people are good at seeing these utilities as computed by these computational models. But still, their decisions are, are affected by the way they perceive their partners, especially when the outcome is not significant. So here, in this part of my work, I design computational models to effectively capture the utility of interruption and then design an abstract game setting to map a real-world domain to a game setting so that we can analyze the outcome easily and do these human experiments. And conducted a user study showing that the collaborative utility matters, but still we need to reason about how people perceive these utilities. So it's not enough to have these computational models. We still need to reason about how people see these benefits in these domains. So at this part, I want to briefly talk about the real-world application of collaboration that I developed with Eric Corvus last year during my internship. This system does not use PRTs or my decision theoretic models, but it captures the main ideas of collaborative activities and the value we can generate by having these collaborative plans. So here we see people distributed in the city. 
They may have different preferences about their morning commute to come to work that day. I mean, there are computer agents working on their sites capturing their preferences about these commutes. They can capture their time cost, the delay cost, and where they are coming from, where they are going in the city. Then these computer agents are delivering all these different preferences into a central optimization system. The optimization system is generating a collaborative plan for these users and giving them the right incentives to collaborate in such a system in terms of payments. So the ABC mechanism, the agent-based carpooling mechanism, is a nice combination of user modeling, optimization, and payment. Here we have the user modeling giving the preferences to the optimization component. The optimization component generates the collaborative plans, and the payment component gives away payments. So how does this system work? First, the agents learn about this people's preferences by looking at their calendars and then generates these initial individual plans, calculates the total cost for these individual plans, including the fuel cost, the time cost, the delay cost, and how much um, cost they have for driving and traffic. Then the optimization component searches multiple factors, including stop ordering, stop timing, stop location, and possible routes to come up with the best possible collaborative plan so that it can minimize the total cost of transportation and notifies the users about these new plans. However, when we have people in the loop as self-interested agents, it's not only enough to build the best collaborative plans, we need to give them incentives so that they will burden the extra cost for picking people on the way and bringing them to work. However, because our collaborative plans depends on the preferences, dynamic preferences of people, it is important to have a payment mechanism that has some nice properties such as truthfulness because we don't want these users lying the system about the preferences they have so that they can adapt um, the, their plans according to their own preferences. For example, I can say, um, I have an important meeting at 9 a.m. and arrange all these carpools according to my preferences although I don't have this important meeting. So in this part of the work, we design payments that induce this good behavior about maximizing the total utility and being truthful and then have, making every user happy in the system. We started with a BC, VCG payment mechanism. Um, in, in this payment mechanism, each agent pays the effect that is bringing to other agents, the value that it generates for the other users. And then experimented with different payment mechanisms to see which payment mechanism works better in real life. Just to show you a brief summary of the results we got from this ABC system, um, we used GPS data collected from Microsoft employees in a five-year period, and then extracted morning commutes from these DPS data and used the adaptive carpooling system to, ge to generate carpooling plans. The picture on the left is showing the traffic for these 215 users before the carpooling system and the picture on the right is showing the, carpool the traffic for these 215 users after the carpooling system. So here by having by bringing these users together in carpooling plans, we are able to reduce the number of commutes by 41%, reduce the total cost by 15%. This cost includes a time cost and a fuel cost, a combination of cost factors, and gas emissions by 22%. So in this real-world application, we developed and tested a complete computational model for self-interested agents uh, to bring these self-interested agents together in collaborative plans. And also we experimented with different challenges and trade-offs we need to make the, to, to make this collaborative planning work in real life. And also demonstrated how much value we can generate for these users and the environment if we can apply these ideas into real world problems. So but you didn't actually deploy it so you couldn't test to see if the victory payments actually work. We didn't test that. Yeah. We kind of calculated 
a baseline, how much value we can generate. <coughs> if people adopt these plants, they, become, they trust the system and they start using the system. And it is a challenge to deploy these systems in real world and how, to see how they perform in real world. In fact, one of my future interests matches um, John's point in that to deploy these computational models in real life, there are different factors we need to investigate. One of them is understanding how people perceive these systems, how they accept these systems. Do they trust these systems or how we can generate in these systems? It is a problem that I'm very interested in for further investigation in the future work. So I believe to make such a system work in real life, we need to understand how social and organizational st structures matter in collaborative plans and how we can use the structure to build better models of collaborative plants by addressing people's concern about sharing information or by utilizing the information that exists in social networks, reputation, and referral. For example, the picture here is showing my Facebook network as a graph. And we can extract distances from this graph to show the set of people I want to collaborate with and the set of people I don't want to collaborate with. And we can include this to the optimization component to reflect my preferences about different people in my network. And finally, it is very important to trust systems, to generate systems that, gen that build trust with people so that the people will be happy to be involved in these systems and adopt these systems. The next challenge that I want to focus on is generating incentives for collaboration. VCG payments that we build in the carpooling system has very nice properties on paper, but we really don't know if they will work with real people. And there's not much work showing how these payment mechanisms work in real life. It is a further challenge to understand what kind of incentives work in real life and what kind of incentives are good for what kind of domains. For example, in the agent-based carpooling systems, I used monetary payments. But in Wikipedia, there are no payments, and people are still collaborating because they want to contribute to something big. It is a part of their utility function. Or we know that altruism, reciprocity, are also factors that are making people collaborate in real world. This way, it's very important to understand these diverse incentives and when one incentive is better than the other. Finally, I am very interested in building these computational models, but also apply them to real world. The agent-based carpooling system was a very nice first step in applying these ideas to real world. But I believe we have a lot of opportunity to use these ideas to other problems such as traffic or managing resources in real world, how we manage energy, or making everyday tasks easier, how we can have computer agents helping people in better ways. But finally, Although we have these very beautiful computational models, payment components, we still need to understand whether people um, are happy to share responsibility with these computer agents and when they want to share responsibility and control with them so that we can always ha reason about how people perceive our systems and use it when we build our systems. So just to summarize my contributions and the work I presented here, um, I presented the probabilistic representations for agents police about the probable plans that teammates are doing, and then use this representation to enable decision theoretic reasoning on teamwork models. I also presented a complete computational model to guide self-interested agents to collaboration in the agent-based carpooling system. I also presented empirical studies of reasoning about helpful behavior and the way people perceive collaborative utility as computed by these computational systems, and the value we can generate by applying these collaborative teamwork ideas to real world, both with, for users and the environment. So the time I spent at Harvard during my PhD and also during my internships at Microsoft Research show me the value of collaboration in real world. So at this point, I want to thank all of, all of my collaborators to make this research possible. And thank you for listening.
And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks very much. So, quick question: How, how, how would you? Uh, I know you thought a little bit about talked about directions to making the carpool system real, real world mm -hmm. versus real data. Um, what uh, kinds of things might you do to to field a, a real world real world version of this? And how much? What are some steps that you see as being difficult with big challenges like payments, for example? How might that work? The first challenge is modeling user preferences in a better way. Our cost function was a simplification. It just cared about the fuel cost, the time cost, and the delay, the delay cost, and also cognitive cost for driving. But as I mentioned in the future work section, we need to think about preferences for the people that people want to collaborate with, or um, how happy they are, how happy they will be for leaving their cars at home and not having a car with them at work that day. And also representing incentives for people's incentives for reducing carbon emissions or Microsoft's incentives for reducing car emissions as a company. There can be all be parts of this total cost function that we are trying to minimize. And also, here we developed a system that knows about these car carpooling plans beforehand. We also have a dynamic system, but still they are a simplification of real world. In the real world, some plans will fail. There will be unpredicted events such as traffic or accidents, things like that. That will make these plans stochastic and unpredictable. And these payment components and optimization system doesn't really reason about what happens in real world when a fa plan fails or um, one of the participants decide not to contribute at all and how we can make this payment system and the uh, carpooling system dynamic. It's a, it's a big optimization challenge to make it work in the real life. I wonder if you can model the effect of <coughs> a leadership in a, in a collaboration. You know, a, a, a leader does a couple things. They, they gather and disseminate information. Right? So that's one way it changes. Um, recipe tree. Mm -hmm. The other way we could change the recipe tree is to alter the costs like for, for not doing things or better rewards for, for doing things. But then of course you have to pay the leader too, right? So there's some cost to have this leader. Um, would, would that be an easy thing to model? I don't think it will be an easy task to model. Um, in the models I presented, I assume that each participant has equal responsibility and they are contributing equally to have the collaborative plan work. But once we have different organizations, such as one is a messenger that is notifying other users, and one is a listener that is adapting the plans accordingly, one person predicts the cost and utilities for different tasks, then we have different division of labor, and we should adapt these decision theoretic models to reflect these different responsibilities and change how agents reason about these helpful behavior models, for example, um, to work given this new hierarchical structure in the plan. So, um, so in, our, in our work with mobile commodities, for example, we, we, we do a lot of thinking about a carpal tree structure, for example. Mm -hmm. A lot of that kind of reasoning was implicit in what we were doing kind of went directly to the decision models, directly to the influence diagrams. Um, how valuable do you think in the re real world the, 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 the probabilistic of trees will be versus the kind of direct modeling approach in terms of their power they give us to put the things through? In the direct planning approach that we applied mobile opportunities to planning, we assume that the world is not changing much and there is not partial information and no uncertainty in the real world. We assume that we know the person, where the person is going, and we did mobile opportunistic planning, given that we know about the person. But in real life, when we apply these mobile opportunistic commerce system into real life, the computer system will not know what the person is doing. It will have an uncertainty about it. It will also have an uncertainty about the world. So I believe this is why PRTs will be important to move this mobile opportunistic planning application to the next step so that the application will not fail under uncertainty and partial information.
And also in the mobile opportunistic planning challenge, we didn't really reason about when these agents need to communicate with the person or what is the utility of communicating, what is the utility of informing. These were all some questions that we didn't answer. And here I show that by having these nice representations, we can do more sophisticated reasoning on when an agent needs to update its plan or when the agent needs to communicate. Right, but, but in reality, when we, the, um, there are times, for example, where the search tree involves a, a mega search with Dijkstra for coming up with a plan that we call as a black box, as opposed to breaking it open and really annotating it with the detailed um, interleaving of, of human and, and machine and, um, actions. So, you know, for John and I right now wrestling and talking to Bay Maps, we deal with, with, with their route planning. Um, they have a very optimized engine that does the, the search to different paths. You know, you can do yourself with calls. And it seems like a big challenge to think about breaking that open, right? Breaking open that, that route planner Mm -hmm. and making that part of the, of the, of the presentation. So this, I guess I'm pointing it out as a challenge, I guess. Yeah. So here I'm not saying we can just get PRTs applied to real world very easily without even thinking about how they would work mm -hmm. in a particular domain. Here I'm just proposing a general representation mm -hmm. that is giving us new ways for reasoning about teamwork, which was not possible before. But still, when we get these PRTs and try to implement in real world, such as mobile opportunistic planning, we need to think about how we get these plans, how we get these probabilities, what do these black boxes represent in real life, and how do we make it work, and what are the complexity challenges, interactability challenges. Um, there are questions need, that need to be answered. But still, we have some tools here that we didn't have before to make this collaboration more successful under uncertainty and partial information. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.